Wonderful to have everyone back. And let's pick up from where the previous conversation with the Secretary General left off. This session is titled The New Strategic Concept, How Will the Transforming Security Environment Affect NATO's Core Task? It's, it's become abundantly clear throughout uh, this morning's discussions that the international security environment is fast evolving and it's obvious that the Alliance needs to rapidly adapt to meet these emerging threats. And in this session, we want to ask and elaborate on how NATO can stay relevant, not just uh, until 2030, but beyond. I'm delighted to welcome a very esteemed uh, panel here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, to my right, uh, please welcome the Spanish Minister of Foreign Affairs, European Union and Cooperation, Minister Jose Manuel Alvarez, ladies and gentlemen. Also delighted to have with me the Albanian Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs. Please welcome Olta Chaka. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, he's Estonian ambassador to NATO and his country's former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Defense. Yuri Luke, ladies and gentlemen, is here. <laughs> let, let's dive right in, Minister uh, Alvarez. Um, Let's take a pulse here amongst the three of you before we open it up and, and see where we at. Uh, what, according to you, are the most pressing security issues and challenges that NATO is facing today? Well, we are heading towards uh, the Madrid summit in which we will have to issue a new strategic concept. So, through all these months, what you are asking us here today, it's what we all have to put together. The first thing is, when we do that, we look towards, towards the future, and we have to do it. But the first thing, we must not forget that we are a security alliance, but a political alliance. So the first thing for the future is to make sure that those bases remain the same. We have to take care of our own security, but we must not forget that we are here also to defend not only a physical space, but also values, democracy, individual liberties, rule of law. Of course, as we are looking towards the future, we have hybrid threats, and we are seeing it today in the border uh, of uh, Belarus, for instance. But we are seeing it also in other places in the world. We are seeing it in Africa. And NATO has to start to look and to think towards the south as well. Because all these asymmetric threats that we have in the eastern border, we can find them also in the south. That's why we need this 360 degree alliance. And today with civil security, the threats are not only physical, military, traditional, but of course we have disinformation. And this is challenge also our political alliance, not only our security alliance, because through this information, it's our democracies that are being challenged, are weakened. It's our public opinion that are disturbed. And we have to think about all these issues and try to put it forward. So as a first approach, I would say, let's keep our basis solid. Security alliance, yes, but also political alliance defending on our values. Let's look 360 degrees, which means let's look more than we have done so far towards the south. And Spain is very well placed to know about it. And let's think about the digitalization, about the civil security, and about the weakening of our societies and our democracy through this information. NATO is not just a security alliance, but a political one as well, where values matter, values that, as we heard from the Secretary General this morning, obviously are very fragile and can be undermined with the click of the button. Minister Chaka, let me also bring you in here and ask you about what you perceive to be the most pressing issues and challenges, security challenges that NATO, the alliance, is facing today. Well, I also think that values are very important and they're the fabric that bring our alliance, uh, that keep our alliance together. But in addition, I think that we need to adapt the alliance to also be able to successfully meet the new gray areas of threats. So to say, as the minister also mentioned, um, um, which involves cyber, artificial intelligence, uh, hybrid threats, arms control, and all of its multifaceted technological and political challenges. So um, I think that we will have also to properly address 
issues that are not conventional to our alliance, such as climate change, the current pandemic, the new energy crisis, um, and the strategic concept, uh, the new strategic or updated strategic concept should also underline the need to adopt our joint efforts in countering disinformation uh, and the biased and active narrative of uh, antagonizing uh, powers aiming to disrupt our unity and our, our cohesion. And I think that doing all of this uh, successfully, in my opinion, demands unity, it demands commitment, but also a lot of flexibility as we move forward because the threat paradigm we face today is simply too fluid and too asymmetrical. A, union, a, a unionized uh, alliance that stands together with a commitment to change a very flexible security environment that we have these days. Yuri Luke, Ambassador, you obviously are very well versed in these issues. You were a foreign minister, you were a defense minister, now you're a country's ambassador uh, to NATO. What do you see as the most pressing security challenges that the alliance is facing? Well, I think the NATO Secretary General made a very important point that NATO has a very strong core. It's the core of values, it's the core of uh, common interests and uh, common concerns, and then at the same time the risks are ever-changing. There was 9-11 and we decided to go out of area as a response. Now there are new threats and we have to address them. We have to be very careful. NATO is not a think tank. So it is very important what NATO actually does in response to concrete, precise threats. For instance, the situation around Ukraine. Many allied nations have raised deep concerns about Russian military movements around Ukraine. Uh, the situation uh, around uh, uh, Belarus, the, the Belarusian hybrid attack uh, against uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland. So the proof is in the pudding. I mean, the strength of the alliance is how we react to those crisis situations. Uh, we, we are very adept at speaking, you know, environmental threats and uh, uh, what have you, global threats, etc., etc. But we have to keep in mind, there are some good old Cold War-like military threats right on the border of our alliance. So it is very important how, react, how we react to them. Yeah, indeed, the proof is in the pudding. And let's move beyond the abstract, shall we, and, and go into much more detail. Minister Alvarez, uh, the Secretary General this morning, uh, once again issued his concern, voiced his concern about the military buildup of Russia on the Ukrainian border, saying we're going to stand with our partner, with our Ukrainian partners. But realistically speaking, the Ukraine is obviously not part of NATO. What options, what leverage does uh, the alliance have here in this particular conflict? The first one is to reaffirm something that is valid for all the people that believe in NATO and in the values of NATO is that territorial integrity, sovereignty are things that NATO will always stand for. We will stand, of course, among ourselves, our the allies, but also with our partners. And that there are things in the world that we will not be allowed. And there are limits to everything. So just the political backing, of course, it's something very important. And then we have to have a dialogue with Russia and to engage with Russia in that dialogue and to try to pass those messages. This is true for Ukraine. This is true for our dialogue with uh, uh, Russia. But it's true for many other regions, also in the Indo-Pacific. All these things, we have a few months ahead before the Madrid summit, in which we will have to reflect, because that will be what NATO will have to do in the next few years. Mm -hmm. Let me just follow up. You said we need to engage in a dialogue uh, with Russia. Don't you think this might be perceived rather as a sign of weakness on the part of Moscow? I mean, we've seen what happened in 2014 in Crimea. It didn't deter the Russians from annexing Crimea. A dialogue probably won't deter them from, from moving in again. So, but you're still pleading. You're still pleading for the dialogue with Russia here at this particular point. Yeah. I think that it's helpful for Ukraine. A dialogue that doesn't mean assuming the point of view of the other. You can engage in a dialogue to state very clearly what is your position and how you will be back in Ukraine. That's the type of dialogue that I'm calling for.
Minister Chaka, of course, uh, the Ukraine not being part of NATO makes this all the more difficult. Uh, clearly, it uh, would have been much more different if any of, uh, any of these countries represented here on stage would have been uh, under the situation. Still, solidarity is something uh, that is easily uttered uh, verbally, but at the end of the day might be hard to actually demonstrate on the ground. What is the solution here? Well, I think that what we've done uh, with the strong statements yesterday and today uh, on Russia is a perfect example of what strong unity looks like, uh, and we've seen it through um, uh, Ukraine. I was really pleased to see that this statement was strong, was, was resolute, uh, the statement that we sent uh, to Russia concerning their behavior with uh, Ukraine, because Obviously, we are deeply concerned with uh, the activities there and the build-up of forces and the continued hybrid uh, activities. Of course, we are not stationing or we are not planning uh, to stationing any forces in the Ukraine, nor are we working with Ukraine on some plan aimed at Russia. Dialogue, I insist, should uh, continue. But we have uh, continued, continually uh, tried to achieve a diplomatic engagement with Russia on Ukraine, including at the highest political and military circles. But we all know now uh, that, uh, unfortunately, such a constructive approach is often interpreted by Russia as hesitation or, or even weakness. So I think it was the right thing to do to warn Russia in no uncertain terms of our unwavering support for Ukraine's independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity, as well as the serious strategic, political and economic consequences it will, fa it, it will face if it opts out of the path of dialogue and continues down the path of confrontation, provocation um, and perhaps escalation. Ambassador, dialogue of course can never be a bad thing. Uh, I think this is something all uh, here in the audience and on stage would disagree. Nonetheless, you of course, your country, uh, pr perhaps unlike Albania and Spain here, feels uh, the influence of Russia much more. Um, therefore, my question once again to you, and, and, and posing it out here, what, how, to, how to counter the Russian aggression on the central and eastern borders at the end of the day? Um, what solution is there, particularly with partners who are not part of NATO? Well, I think it's very important when one speaks about the dialogue with Russia, and I'm all for dialogue. In fact, I have negotiated with uh, our Russian neighbors several times regarding the withdrawal of Russian troops, uh, border treaty, other issues. Uh, it is very important to be firm. It is very important to have the core of your convictions. Then there is a mutual respect. Then you might uh, uh, achieve something. Uh, for Russians, negotiations are often sort of, uh, they are kind of, uh, uh, when, when we say that dialogue for us is often just a dialogue. You kind of open up the field, you discuss issues, it is a positive thing. Uh, for Russians, it's always a give and take. So some of the things, most of the things Russians want from us, we cannot give. So we have to keep that in mind when speaking about the dialogue. But in principle, it's of course good to have a dialogue uh, I hope it will let, lead to, to better understanding. What allied nations can do is what allied nations have done, which is to provide political support uh, to our uh, Ukrainian friends, but also to provide uh, means of self-protection, like uh, weaponry. I would commend here the United States, the UK, uh, Turkey, who have provided modern um, high-tech uh, weaponry which is necessary to protect. It is not an aggressive move to provide weapons for self-protection of the nation. That is in fact something which is uh, natural, which, which we should do. So we are, we are certainly I think all NATO nations are very open to that. Minister Alvarez, uh, once again, you pleaded and, and feel for dialogue, something that any good diplomat should do, of course. But how confident are you really about NATO's readiness, willingness, um, and readiness and willingness to protect its uh, allies if and when needed? I hope that the 
uh, that's something that will become obvious if need be. Otherwise, the alliance will have no point of being. But the, I've heard carefully what the ambassador has said. That, and of course, when you engage in a dialogue, there is always this possibility of saying, well, we'll talk, but what's, what's the end of this talking? It's just for the sake mm -hmm. of talking. That's not the type of dialogue that I think we have, we must have with Russia. We engage in a dialogue to make clear our point, to stand very clearly how we will back Ukraine. We can engage with any other country that we consider a threat in a given time to explain him, listen, this is what will happen. And then, of course, if we don't get through this dialogue, to this deterrence dialogue, if we can call it uh, that way, to any point, we will have to see how to act. But we have to give this chance, not to dialogue, but to the deterrence of dialogue. It's always better to do deterrence through dialogue than through military action. And of course, the alliance, the whole point of the alliance is that we will all stick together if some of us, we need that help. And so there's no contradiction to what the ambassador was saying. Both of you are saying we need to engage uh, with Russia, but the ambassador is saying strength really is, is the language that is being understood uh, in, in Moscow. I think there's no misunderstanding here and there's no incompatibility. Uh, something that you would concur, Minister uh, Chaka? Absolutely. I think that one of the challenges that we have and one of the things that should be part of, of the new strategic concept is that uh, this need for taking the initiative, for being resolute. And I think we have to some extent seeded um, initiative to our rivals uh, who are making the most out of these opportunities and are constantly testing our resolve, our preparedness and our will, our red lines through the so-called gray, gray area thread that I also mentioned a little bit earlier and uh, the challenges that never quite cross the red line into direct conflict. R Ukraine is definitely um, uh, the example, but also Belarus. Uh, and we need to take back the initiative in relation to these adversaries and formulate clear, decisive answers to their challenge. And I just have an example uh, to illustrate what I mean by it and it's the Western Balkans where Albania also sits. The Western Balkans is undoubtedly one of the great success stories of NATO and multilateral engagement. In the 1990s, the region bore more similarity to uh, Syria than to what it has become today. It was NATO that stopped the bloodshed and paved the way for the EU to work with the region and achieve such amazing progress in terms of democratization, economic development, and regional cooperation. The membership of Albania, North Macedonia, and Montenegro was yet another crucially important develop, development in guaranteeing the security and stability of the region. And yet, for all the good work, the Western Balkans are, in a sense, a job not finished. And now all the achievements of the past 20 years are once again, if I may say, in danger owing in no small part to the intervention of NATO and EU rivals, Russia foremost among them. Look at Bosnia-Herzegovina, for instance, or look at the north of uh, Kosovo. These are clear signs of the same hybrid attacks that we have witnessed in many other member states through the same instruments, through media, through social media, through political and business networks, and focus on, on identity politics. And in terms of taking back the initiative and denying space and vacuums to rivals, the Western Balkans are a low-hanging fruit. And it would take, um, all that it would take is a committed, strong, and resolute involvement to solve the remaining disputes and include the Western Balkans in, in the NATO strategy. And the Western Balkans provide yet another important lesson, which is also <laughs> Uh, one of my points, that uh, many of the challenges to our collective security that we face have no clear military solution. And in some cases, there is no obvious mili military solution at all. And yet, the threats to our security are very real. Think, for instance, the threats coming from the southern flank, from the instability and poverty in the North African area, and what role 
can the alliance play in such areas? And I think that the Western Balkans are the perfect example where security threats are addressed not only through military intervention, but through a holistic combination, and that would be sort of my suggestion, a combination of hard and soft power, as well as a commitment for the long run, and I do not presume to say that the two situations are the same, but the blueprint for engagement certainly is. So the Western Balkans the situation, the Western Balkans, the example of the Western Balkans and NATO's role there could serve as an example. Your country, of course, been member since 2009, been, been benefiting from, from being part uh, of this alliance. Thanks so much for pointing out um, the region again, bringing that region in. But let's stay a bit closer here, uh, Ambassador, and let's look at the humanitarian crisis that is uh, unfolding at the Belarusian border. Um, we all know that uh, Lukashenko is orchestrating the search of migrants trying to get into the EU via Belarus in, in response to economic sanctions imposed by him by the EU. Now, of course, Latvia, the country that we're in today, Lithuania, Poland, all countries heavily affected by this cynical move. Again, what is the solution here? Does NATO have a role here? Well, uh, NATO's role depends very much on the decisions by Latvia, Lithuania and Poland because any NATO country can call upon the alliance uh, uh, to gather and to discuss and look at the security situation uh, also below so-called uh, Article 5 th uh, threshold. And it is usually colloquially called uh, evoking Article 4. Uh, the, the countries have not decided to do so at the moment. So I think their judgment is that NATO at this point uh, is not the first responder, that there are other organizations, the European Union uh, with its agencies, uh, even the United Nations is now involved. Uh, but obviously NATO is there. There are NATO troops in all the countries uh, uh, which you mentioned. And uh, if the situation worsens, it's also possible that Uh, uh, the uh, NATO's uh, sort of deterrent role uh, should be increased. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't say that at the moment NATO can do anything specific. But the blame on the situation lies squarely on Lukashenko. He has uh, decided to conduct a hybrid war against the allied members. And, of course, also the blame for the humanitarian catastrophe lies on Lukashenko. So the international community should be very, caref uh, very clear at its focus on who is the source uh, of this tragedy and who can stop this tragedy. Minister Alvarez, the situation at the border, the humanitarian crisis is indeed quite concerning and which prompted the Secretary General uh, and the President of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, to make a rare joint appearance uh, to, to send a very clear uh, signal there. Do you think uh, this cooperation here, uh, NATO, the EU, mm, it, you, you know, situations like that in Belarus could be an impetus for both institutions to work closer together? Is, is that the solution here? Absolutely. Uh, I really believe that uh, there is everything to win from the synergy between European Union and NATO in general. In cases like this, in which we are uh, uh, facing hybrid uh, attacks, even more. We must take very seriously, very, very seriously, the misuse of irregular migration as a weapon, uh, using human, w uh, human beings as if they were bullets. Uh, Spain is an uh, external border of the European Union. We know very well the phenomenon of irregular migration. And there are many countries today in the eastern border, but also in the southern border of NATO and the European Union that uh, are ready to use human beings and the human suffering as a weapon to make pressure, to put pressure on us to get their political means. This is totally unacceptable. And um, both of us, we must be ready, European Union and NATO, to react to that. And one very important thing, traditionally, when we are facing irregular migration, we had a tendency to think that because that was happening far away from us, didn't concern us. Spain never thought that way. 
we were always showing solidarity towards the eastern countries or any country that was facing uh, irregular migration. We always thought that what was going on in the eastern border was part of our own security. That's why since many years ago in this country, in Latvia, we have the enhanced force of NATO, Spanish troops that will visit right after uh, talking to you. And that's why we have this air policing force for the security of the Baltics, because the security of the Baltics, the security of Latvia, it's also the security of, of, of Spain when it comes to this matter. The opposite, it's also true. So one very important issue from here to the Madrid strategic concept will be to make sure that we have the excellent integration between European Union, European Union reflection, European Union defense, and NATO, NATO reflection, NATO defense. So European Union is that European pillar of NATO. The more integrated we are, the more jointly we act together, the stronger will be our deterrence and the clearer will be our determination towards all those people that want to weaken us. So closer cooperation, uh, when the opportunity presents itself, like in this particular case, is desirable, is something that should be promoted and pursued. Uh, Minister Chaka, the, the term hybrid attacks, hybrid warfare has been mentioned quite a number of times, and usually it focuses on disinformation, it focuses on cyber attacks, but now we have the current situation in Belarus where we see an instrumentalization of human beings for, poli for political purposes. This is a new dimension. Uh, if you will, uh, of, of hybrid warfare. Um, again, the question, what, what's, uh, what would be the role for NATO? Is it closer cooperation with the European Union? Is that something um, that, that, uh, you know, that this col collaboration has to be strengthened and emerge in times like these? Well, I think that NATO as an alliance uh, was created to guarantee the collective security of its members from a very conventional security threat namely the Soviet Union. But NATO was never set up to meet these unconventional uh, threats, which militaries uh, the world over have traditionally considered to be police work, right? Or uh, at most a matter for the security of the apparatus of, of the member states that are sort of being affected by the spillover effects of, uh, of these hybrid threats. Of course, the thinking now has changed, and it should change, because we are faced with different challenges. And what has changed it completely is the realization that these conventional threats and challenges have very real implications for our security, but also the fact that our rivals are using such instruments to challenge us. And I'm talking about the so-called uh, hybrid uh, asymmetrical strategies, which in essence are guerrilla campaign tactics used by states in their uh, geopolitical competition for power. So what should NATO do? Uh, I think a good place to look for an answer is that by um, analyzing the strategies of, of our rivals. Uh, what are their aims and objectives? What are their instruments? Uh, which is one of the points that I wanted to make, that the reason why anyone uses these tactics, this guerrilla tactics is because the adversary is too powerful to face conventionally. And NATO is the greatest, most powerful military alliance that has ever existed and a unified, solidaire alliance, one where both sides, as also mentioned, of the Atlantic work very closely together for the common good, I believe is simply too much to handle for any of our rivals. So I think that a stress on unity and a stress on cohesion must uh, continue to be the first priority of, uh, of the updated concept, of this new strategic concept, especially now when, let us admit it, there have been several serious issues in, in this regard. Yeah, indeed, very serious issues, Ambassador. Um, if, if we look at, we, we've been talking about NATO being the strongest uh, alliance in the, in the history, uh, a very success story, if you will, but both in the terms, in, in the case of the annexation of Crimea or now in the cynical game of Lukashenko at the border, the, the answer really has been sanctions, sanctions on, on, on Putin, sanctions on Lukashenko. They don't really work, do they? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that because uh, we 
never know what would have happened if there would have been no sanctions. I think sanctions are a strong deterrent against further actions against kind of escalation of uh, various aggressive activities. Take, for instance, Ukraine. I mean, if you remember how the whole conflict started, President Putin spoke about the Novorossiya project, which basically is half of Ukraine. Uh, now, still the gains of Russia in Ukraine are fairly limited. And of course, we hope uh, that they will not increase. But I think the sanctions have played an important role of stopping or at least slowing down the escalation. Uh, so I would very much uh, call upon people who say sanctions don't work. Uh, it depends on what we expect from the sanctions. We shouldn't have expectations like, uh, you know, uh, Russia is giving up Crimea because of sanctions. That is extremely unlikely. But sanctions can have a very positive in fact, impact, and I think uh, that should be uh, appreciated. But I, I'd like to point out something which uh, the minister said here. I think one of the advantages of the alliance is also that it has taken from the table the threat of a conventional attack against a NATO member. So in some ways, using hybrid is also weakness of our adversaries. Uh, I'm sure they would be happy to use conventional tactics because often they are stronger than us in terms of conventional troops. But uh, this option has been taken, hopefully forever, off the table by NATO's firmness. So the adversary has to use hybrid tactics. And while the hybrid is uh, uh, a, a, an a nuisance, if you will, uh, it usually doesn't uh, provide an existential threat to a NATO member. Mm. And as we know, during the history of the alliance, no NATO member has been attacked in a conventional way. Minister Alvarez, of course we're talking about NATO and NATO's future here at a time when the challenges are bleak. We're talking about Belarus, we're talking about Russian military buildup uh, at the Ukrainian border, we're talking about a very self-confident imposing China. And this all comes at a time when the U.S. hasty and NATO hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan is already, uh, has I would argue, undermined and perhaps wounded the reputation and standing of the alliance a, a bit. Uh, th there, there is no NATO without the United States of course, without a full commitment on the part of Washington. But we have to take note that America is withdrawing from world events. Uh, but frankly, and to be fair, not something that started under President Trump. Now we have President Biden, who stated at the Munich Security Conference, the US is back. But clearly, even there, we see the focus is very much on China. How concerned are you about uh, American withdrawal from the world? We are seeing a reshaping of the world, the reshaping of the threats that we uh, are facing, the reshaping of the priorities of many countries. The United States is probably rethinking their priorities, as you say, not from today, but from many years ago. I think that the natural ally of Europe remains and will remain always the United States and vice versa, by the way. The only thing is, as the world evolved, the world is very different as it emerged from, from 1945. What we have to do as Europeans is to make a reflection, and let's not forget, parallel to the strategic concept of Madrid, there will be uh, another strategic uh, reflection, the strategic compass in European Union. It's already going. We have to decide for us Europeans what's a threat. What's a threat for us? And then to have a very high level dialogue with the United States and to see what we have to do on our own and what we will do with the United States, either because the United States don't want to engage with us on that particular threat, saying, okay, it's fair, that's a threat for you, but I will not engage for you, or because we consider that we have to do it on our own. And that's not opposite to continue and strengthening NATO. There is no way that as European we can think about a European defense outside NATO. 
just because we don't even have the capabilities. And that's different from saying because we have and we are in different parts of the world because we are societies that are not completely identical. Sometimes we have threats that we will address on our own. Afghanistan is a very good lesson. If you don't like the way we have left Afghanistan, we should have the means, we should give us the means to live otherwise. Mm -hmm. But once again, what's very important, that doesn't mean that there will be an opposition between NATO and European Union, and definitely there will be no opposition between Europe and United States because we are the natural allies. I think uh, that, that is understood, but even Washington uh, is appealing uh, for, is supporting and appealing for the EU in developing their own strong military uh, capabilities. As you know, there's a lot of theory and talk and rhetoric uh, on EU strategic uh, economy, but it doesn't ever seem to go beyond the theory and rhetoric, does it, Minister? It's, we are thinking about it. We have a European military fund already in our budget. And actually, if you see what we are doing in the Sahel, here we are uh, in Latvia, and we are looking and talking about the East. But the threats come from everywhere. If you see what we are doing in the Sahel, we are doing it on our own, the Europeans. It's all that reflection that we have to push. And of course, if we consider that we have our own threats, and that we will have to deal with them, we will have to have our own capacities. Mm -hmm. That's out of question. And that's the historical point where we are. I think on the reflection, we all agree. Now we need the political will to go beyond and to get our own capacities. Uh, Minister Chaka, the US and uh, Europe uh, will remain natural allies, as Minister Ivar, as something that will not change. But at the end of the day, again, the point is that uh, Washington, the U.S., is expecting much more independence, uh, much more self-reliance on the part of the Europeans. Is that something that, that uh, we can provide? Is that something where you see concrete uh, steps being taken towards? Well, I think that there should be more unity. I think there should be more cohesion. I think that there should be more coordination uh, because we are uh, being faced by new challenges and by a reshaping of the world order, if I may, if I may say so. Uh, NATO uh, is an uh, incredible military alliance, uh, the strongest, uh, no doubt, uh, and it should be very flexible amidst all these challenging and this uh, reshaping of, of the world uh, order. And this is no small feat, considering that this alliance is composed by 30 democracies which have to take their own decisions through complicated and often <coughs> very exhausting uh, political processes. But what I also think it requires, and this goes also to show that there should have been a better communication strategy when it comes to Afghanistan, but also on, on other issues. I believe that uh, our alliance falls a little bit short at promoting its achievements, at promoting its work, um, and it does not enough for our domestic uh, audiences. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do um, is that uh, when, especially when faced with all the hybrid threats uh, that aim to undermine our, our cohesion, I think that we need to focus a little bit more on, on what I call public diplomacy, diplomacy and communication. And I do not mean to ignore or leave aside all the important uh, issues, uh, obviously modernizing our, our militaries, investing, uh, so, such as financing and new technologies and so on. But they are of paramount importance. But I want to focus on, on public diplomacy communication because I do not think it gets the attention it should and uh, because this is one area where I think also our country, Albania, can contribute as sort of a very important crossroads between uh, the East and the West, and because of our unique experience of religious harmony and, and brotherhood. I remember a while back when I was uh, the Minister of Defense and I was having a conversation about building a research uh, center on diplomacy and communication with a friend who was also a retired uh, general, and I was trying to brainstorm with him about uh, this idea. So we were talking and I noticed that he did not sound very um, sort of convinced uh, by the idea, so I asked him what was bothering him, and he said, I'm used to soldiers, to guns, and weapon system. 
um, these ideas of communication and diplomacy are very uh, fluffy to me. Um, so I think that we need to pay a little bit more attention to, to the fluffy, that's, that's my conclusion. We need to pay more attention to these applies to communication and our domestic public opinion about the role and mission of NATO so that we can have more unity and more cohesion from both sides of the Atlantic and come together all as one when it comes to certain <coughs> challenges and decision making. Ambassador, yeah. Minister uh, Chaka is saying the, the NATO is not, the alliance is not good at promoting itself, it's not good at uh, selling its successes. Uh, it has a branding issue, if I understand the minister correctly. Is that something that you would concur with? Uh, well, as I said, the, the proof is in the pudding. So. Uh. If NATO can not only speak about the threats, but act on new threats, on old threats, that's really the biggest advertisement uh, to the alliance. Uh, and uh, also, I think the, the fact that there is a strong transatlantic bond, that NATO is the, the impediment, uh, is the sort of uh, embodiment of the uh, transatlantic uh, bond uh, is also extremely important because uh, I think in PR and in strategic communication, if Europe and the United States speak with one voice, that message will resonate very far. Uh, let me o only sort of make, make one point. I, I, I'm personally not worried about the United States, the United States turning to the Pacific, because let's remember the Cold War. During the Cold War, most of the actual hot action was in the Pacific or near the Pacific. Uh, let's take Korean War. Let's take Viet, uh, Vietnam War. Let's take the recognition of Red uh, China. Uh, and uh, moving recognition from Taiwan to, to Red China, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a lot of activity. And it doesn't mean that the United States doesn't have enough resources to stay in Europe and be a serious uh, power in Europe. We have approximately 20 minutes left. So I'm going to come to the audience in just a moment. Let, let's do a final round here amongst us, and then I'm going to open up here. Uh, Minister Alvarez, some say, you know, these, uh, the Russian intimidation of Ukraine, Russian intimidation of Georgia could be easily solved uh, on the part of NATO, namely by incorporating these countries, by enlarging, by making them members. Um, now, it's a 30-country it's a 30, 30 country strong alliance. How realistic is that? How, how, how quickly or how realistic do you foresee changes as far as additional new members to the alliance are concerned in the near future? Well, there are many reasons why you can integrate the country in NATO, but I would say just because they feel threatened is not the best approach to it. We, we should uh, get into NATO many, many countries, and that's not a good approach to it. What we have to see is, because there are many ways of protecting those countries without integration. Integration means, do they really share our values? Do they really share our values of democracy, of rule of law? for instance, do they have joint capacities that we will, they will integrate uh, with us? They will understand the solidarity that we must have among ourselves. That's the reason why we integrate countries in NATO. Spain integrated 40 years ago, exactly, so we were not uh, among those that found it, but about those that integrated. It was impossible at a given point because Spain didn't meet those standards. And probably Spain was threatened by uh, surrounding um, uh, threats. Uh, but that was not the good reason. The good reason was the day Spain became a full democracy, the day uh, Spanish military forces were ready to join NATO. So it's more a question of approach. Mm -hmm. I don't think that saying they are threatened, let's bring them in. We can protect them very well, even if they are not integrated. And above all, we must get always a strong NATO with very strong members in it. Minister Chaka, uh, 
before we close up um, here the discussion on, on the stage and bring in the audience, you've mentioned the positive impact that NATO has had on the Western Balkans, obviously Montenegro, Northern Macedonia, the, the, the latest to join uh, the alliance. Should we grant the same courtesy? Should we grant the same gesture, the same uh, outreach to, to Georgia and, the, and Ukraine? I don't know that there's a, um, a real parallel that can, be, that can be made there. I said that definitely the Western Balkans are the blueprint for engagement of, uh, of others in the alliance. Obviously, I believe that values are the most important thing. We should look for values, for what uh, unites us. And I think that it's not by chance that our rivals are also attacking our, our values. Because um, um, uh, in this, they are also helped by a moment of confusion, I would say, in terms of values in our midst too. Because unfortunately, in many member states, the basic values of democracy, of rule of law, of equality, have come under attack by parties and, and governments. We've seen that in, in different countries. And these values are the glue that holds our, our alliance together. So we should cherish what we have and we should look for them in others. Otherwise, we might as well be a collection of states with uh, varying security considerations and priorities and not much to unite us. So as we take care of this glue that, that keeps us together, we try to, uh, uh, to look for them also in other countries as, uh, as we try to expand our alliance and, um, and our security parameters. Ambassador, uh, any, any chance of adding new members to the 30 that we have up until this point? Well, I think uh, NATO's open door policy has been a real success. And all three of us are really the, the uh, symbols uh, of, uh, of that success from different periods uh, and from different times. Uh, I think maintaining a strong open door policy is very important also in the strategic concept. It's not only Ukraine and Georgia. Let's remember that, for instance, Finland and Sweden have the policy that they do not ex uh, in exclude membership of the alliance. They are saying that they don't want to join now, but they want to keep this option open. So we have to keep the door open. Uh, but when it comes to Ukraine and Georgia, let's remember that the alliance has made a decision in principle. In 2008, the final communique of the heads of state and government states very clearly Ukraine and Georgia will be members of NATO, full stop. So uh, it hasn't happened today, the circumstances are not right, there's no consensus, but I always say my, to my Georgian and Ukrainian friends, don't lose hope. Uh, it, it was the same for the Baltic states. Nowadays it looks as if the road of uh, the Baltic states to NATO was uh, a paved sort of smooth ride I, I'm sure there are a lot of people here in the room who remember that this wasn't the case. It was very difficult for us to get in. There were loads of skeptics. And uh, uh, then suddenly we had a window of opportunity and we were ready to take it because we were ready as countries, both in terms of values, market economy, uh, approach to, to various uh, issues we were like the other members so it was very easy then to make a decision so you have to be ready you don't have you shouldn't lose hope you have to be ready and your moment will come Kiev and Tbilisi is the, are listening. Your moment will come, says the ambassador. We have approximately 50 minutes left because uh, the minister actually has to leave to visit his troops, which you mentioned, and I don't want to keep him up here. So I think we have uh, time for three, four questions, which I'm going to collect uh, because uh, can we have a microphone here in the first uh, row? Please introduce yourself and do me a favor, uh, be brief, uh, because that's how I can uh, squeeze in as many questions as I can. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Ali. Uh, Katarzyna Pisarska, Professor Katarzyna Pisarska. I'm the chair of the Warsaw Security Forum in Poland. Uh, my question goes, I want to actually build up on your discussion. My question goes to Minister Alvarez. You very rightly said that enlargement is for these countries who share our values, understand what solidarity is, and show interoperability with NATO. And I think that's the definition of what Ukraine is doing. 
It is a country that's sharing our values, fighting for democracy, fighting to change its country, reform it, while it's showing solidarity with us, fighting an opponent that sees us as a threat, as an enemy, Russia. And last but not least, Ukraine has been in all uh, NATO missions, from Afghanistan to many others. So how uh, do you say to Ukraine that it should not have an option of enlargement uh, on the table? And has Russia not already succeeded? Because through a buildup, a military buildup, through a Crimean annexation, it actually has reached its goal. It has furthered uh, any enlargement perspective for Ukraine and Georgia. All right. Thank, you. Th thank you so much, Kaja. I'm going to pose the question to the minister in just a moment. I see the microphone is already being passed here. <laughs> go, go ahead. I got it, Ari. Yeah. Mikhail Baranovsky, uh, GMF, Warsaw director. I have a question to Ambassador Yurilik. Um, Ambassador, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, that because of the strength of our uh, alliance, uh, on the military side, we are pushing, so to say, Russia below the threshold of, of war. We've been talking about the hybrid tactics, but mostly in the context of resilience. Uh, um, uh, Secretary Stoltenberg very, very much clearly uh, you know, mentioned this in his remarks. So my question is, should we look at deterrence by punishment also under the threshold of war? This is where the new conflicts will be taking place. Should we be not only resilient but be able to show to the potential adversary what can happen to them if they hurt us below the threshold. No, thank you so much. Please uh, take notes of the questions. I'm coming to you for the answers. Madam President, go ahead. Thank you. I thought I will ask uh, from our southern flank a question which concerns them. Uh, in strategic concept, thinking how much you have contributed now through Baltic Air Police and also in EFP, we have been reciprocating through high participation in Frontex working or in Irini mission, South Sudan, issues in United Nations, participating in Mali and uh, Central African Republic, uh, missions with French, various issues. But what are the expectations of the NATO southern flank now on the new strategic concept? Because I think today we are much more hearing indeed about the eastern flank, but we should be balanced. Thank you. Thank you. The last two questions, the lady and then over there the gentleman. Please keep your hand up so the microphone is coming to you, otherwise it might get lost. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Lolly Tusigan, I'm from uh, here, uh, Rego, Latvia. I wanted to ask a question about a uh, uh, possibly lost opportunity. In the 1990s, uh, the relationship between Russia and NATO was actually quite good. Uh, Russia joined NATO Partnership for Peace. Uh, the President Yeltsin uh, is said to have said that he would like Russia to join NATO, even that. Uh, probably there was a case of lost opportunity and not sufficient readiness on behalf of NATO. Would you like to analyze that? Thank right. you. Thank you. Last question, please, gentlemen. Uh, Nikolai Kabanov, uh, Member of Parliament of Latvia. Uh, my question uh, to the uh, honored guest from Albania. Uh, how do you see the prospects of uh, Serbian uh, membership in NATO? Thank you. Thank you so much. So, quite, quite, uh, quite a number of wide-ranging uh, questions here. Minister Alvarez, let's start with you and perhaps with the question that came straight from Kaja uh, about U Ukraine. You were saying, you know, it's, it's, it's not just a military alliance but a political one as well. Values have to be shared. She's saying Ukraine is already doing that. Your response? I agree with you and I hope it was very clear that what I said is exactly what you said. Of course, I'm not going to discuss here. I will discuss it in the table of the Atlantic Council, the accession of this or that country. I was talking in general. Uh, the uh, backing of Spain uh, to Ukraine's uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty is out of question. Out of question in NATO and out of question in European Union. We have said it publicly. I said it publicly today several times. And we take very seriously, very seriously, the security of the eastern flank, including Poland. I'm backing today in uh, European um, Ministers of Foreign Affairs Council, uh, my uh, Polish friend and colleague, Minister of Foreign Affairs, 
and we are standing together on sanctions. And I'm saying also publicly. That's why in this country, in Latvia, since many years ago there are Spanish troops, I will visit them in a very few minutes uh, in the enhanced force. And that's why there is the air policing um, uh, force with Spanish aeroplanes in the Baltics. So on that issue, no lessons to take. On the uh, southern flank, there must be a balance. There must be a balance. The possibility of hybrid attacks exists also on our southern border. And Spain is right there, right in the front. We have Mali, we have the Sahel. It's totally destabilized. Libya, although there are some improvement, I was in Tripoli in the international conference a month and a half ago, it's far from being really stabilized. We have jihadism, we have all sorts of trafficking, and this goes even beyond to Western Sub-Saharan Africa and to the Gulf of Guinea. So we have to look there. And also something very important, we have partners that want to engage with us. Because when we think about Africa, when we think about the Maghreb, we only think in terms of threats. They are there, they, are exi they exist, there are people that might be thinking there about hybrid attacks, as we are seeing in the eastern border, but we have also very good partners ready to engage with NATO if we give them the opportunity. Why not thinking about NATO involvement in the Sahel now that because we've been on the ground for many years, there is a sort of fatigue from some of the big actors that are already there. In any case, it's better to see NATO in the Sahel than to see the Wagner force, for instance. So we have to think about all that. Th thank you. Minister Shaka, which uh, there was a question directed yeah. towards you. We talked about Ukraine, about Georgia. Uh, Serbia has been thrown in the mix here. Go ahead. Well, I think I don't exaggerate if I say that the world today has become more dangerous than it has been in a while. Um, and I think that uh, the security environment, the threats have changed substantially, but not fundamentally. Uh, but there has been a change in scale rather than a change in essential nature of, of the threats that we face. And of scale and of escalation with many of the threats and challenges that uh, we face, that we have faced becoming more accentuated, more pressing and more urgent and in need of uh, more real action and to possibly address them in, in the new uh, strategic uh, concept, which I think is very, very important. I've always been a very strong promoter of the open door policy because I come from a region that has benefited greatly from uh, multinational engagement. I come from a region that has always sort of on a balance played with integration politics and identity politics. And every time our strategic allies, be that uh, NATO, the United States, or the European Union put a foot on identity uh, politics, then integration politics would come up and the region would come together, integrate and work together, coordinate economically, and eventually bypass those ethnic problems, those, bi those bilateral problems that has caused us so much conflict and, and suffering. But right now in the region, what we've seen with NATO be more strategic and sort of putting their foot down on identity politics, we are not necessarily seeing with the European Union and our integration process. So I think the door should be open. I think that the open door policy is the important thing to do, obviously in our region, but even, even further. And a clear concept, a clear strategic concept should be part of, of this new uh, of this new document of, uh, of our alliance. Ambassador, final remarks so we can get Minister Alvarez out here on time and don't uh, have the troops waiting for him. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, using that moment, I would say how uh, important it is and how grateful we are that our southern allies are making such an input to the policy of what we call the eastern flank. And the fact that Spanish leopards are here, that uh, Italians are flying F-35s out of Amari, Estonia, uh, in air policing uh, operation. Uh, these are enormously important signals of the unity of the alliance. And as the president already mentioned, uh, 
uh, we are in Mali in an operation very far from our shores in the south. Uh, and Mali, in fact, is now the biggest Estonian operation abroad. Uh, so we really do our best in, in uh, 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 reinforcing the idea that the alliance security is 360 degrees. Very quickly about deterrence. I mean, uh, I, I won't go deep in the, the deterrence theory. The problem is that usually we cannot respond with the same hybrid tricks as our adversaries play, play on us. I mean, if you consider the situation of what Lukashenko is doing. So we have to choose other means. But punishment is not totally uh, out of, uh, out of uh, view when we speak threats like cyber, for instance. There are a number of uh, NATO countries who have stated that not only their defensive capabilities, but also their offensive capabilities are provided to the alliance if necessary. And I think this is a strong statement uh, to all adversaries. Don't play around in the NATO, uh, don't play around in the cyber sphere. You might get yourself into big trouble. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I speak for all when I say this has been a fascinating, very wide-ranging, content-rich uh, debate here uh, on stage. We're going to uh, take a quick break, going to be back here at 12.30, but before we do, please join me in thanking Minister Alvarez, Minister Chaka, and Ambassador Luke for a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for you. having me.